Okay, it's day 96. So as you can see, growth is a lot more robust and that central plant is making a comeback. So what we're witnessing here is the regeneration of the shoot apical meristem. Now this plant is on its way to making a new true leaf. It's very dark green, as is this leaf that supplied this plant with nutrition this entire time. And this leaf uh, is probably just waiting to die. So there are tendrils just whipping all over the place. And the plant, and this plant is mostly just binding to itself. And here's another example. So this is the most dominant plant. It's continuously trying to get tendrils to bind to everything. I don't really know why it's embarked on such an active tendril mode right now. Maybe it just needed to reach a certain threshold of maturity. And it has this tendril which is making a play on this leaf which belongs to the second best plant. So one thing that concerns me is as this most dominant plant and the second place plant continue to grow and I'll try to get them to grow in a spiral, you know, clockwise by spinning around the pot to let phototropism kick in in a clockwise pattern. You know, these tendrils that are bound to existing plastic uh, support columns or, you know, even to the other vine, will that like cause something to rip or warp? Okay, it's day 98 of this honeydew germination experiment. So as you can see, there's just more growth. Uh, the dominant vine has sort of fallen towards the center where it's uh, also exhibiting some phototropism and curling, you know, upwards again. And it has very, very long tendrils that are just looking for things to bind on. I need to get more of these uh, support columns. So that leaf belongs to the same plant and it's dying and I'll have that removed at some point. These three leaves belong to the second most robust plant and they're basically sort of hanging on there. Uh, they're not quite dead yet. So that's the site of the tear from a few weeks ago and it's sort of healed to the best extent that it can although it still looks sort of ghastly. Uh, the plant will do just fine. So the tendrils have grown very long on this uh, number one plant and I'm not sure what they really do, you know, they provide very, very little structural support in my opinion. So we're looking at the shoot apical meristem of this third plant and it has two new true leaves that are developing quite nicely. So the fungus gnats and other bugs have largely abandoned this pot since I uh, covered the soil with a lot of sand and I'd like to add to that a little bit, maybe filter out these big rocks and uh, get in some more fine grains to fill in all the cracks. So in conclusion this honeydew pot has a great future because I don't really see anything threatening it for a long time and I'm sure the soil is very moist. It's still probably not yet the right time to add more water in the tray at the bottom. Alright this is 10x fast forwarded footage of me in full gear and full sun basically sifting through the dirt. I'm putting it into the sifter and you know kind of twirling the dirt around with my fingers to get all the small fine particles to sift through and I'm continuously picking out larger uh, wood chips uh, little rocks and things like that to get rid of everything that's aesthetically unpleasing and basically I want a thin layer of sand to guard against any pests especially fungus gnats and other winged insects that parasitic flies that want to try to get in there and lay larvae uh, or eggs that will hatch into larvae and try to chew on the roots and whatnot once they run out of decaying organic matter to eat. So this is a very arduous process. Uh, what you see here is about let's say 24 minutes uh, before the camera battery ran out and I decided not to continue recording because I was uh, you know finishing up and I was all dirty so I didn't want to um, just show you more and more of the same stuff. So yeah, this will go on for about another minute or so. But over time, it's uh, you know it's still interesting to watch. You can see the soil basically turn uh, fine. It looks like almost reddish outside because the balcony walls are all painted red or orange. But 
Um, the sand is actually closer to kind of a gray, um, I don't know, dark beige or tan or whatever. So it kind of gives the impression that I'm at the beach when I look at my pots. And this trick has definitely worked really well and I'm so glad I don't have to use insecticides to keep out the bugs. Earlier on in this series I did use insecticides as you can recall. I used that Bear Advance that was, I don't know, like seven years old or whatever that was just sitting under my various kitchen sinks as I moved from apartment to apartment. But basically that's, you know, I don't think that's going to be a big deal. Um, nothing on it says that you can't use it around humans. So, you know, the less insecticide I can use, I think the better. And so far, it's been a few days, uh, well, maybe over a week or two for this one, and the sand has really done its job very well. It's the 100th day anniversary of this honeydew germination experiment, and things have come a long way, although there have been so many setbacks. I have three vines that are finally developing. So the first thing you'll notice is that I installed a lot more support columns so basically you'll have leaves spilling out occasionally like this and that's fine but I don't want a huge mess because it makes this a lot harder to film and manage indoors. Also if this gets to the final stage and starts flowering then I want to be able to carry the pot outside so bees can pollinate it. So I'm sure that an experienced farmer with modern techniques and uh, fertilizer and etc would be able to generate much more robust plants but I've had so many setbacks as a novice to honeydew growing that I basically didn't really stand a chance at the beginning. So I don't know what triggered this but the second most robust plant and the first one have tendrils that are actually working now. So this one attaches to what I'll call plant number two. This is a shoot apical meristem. And here on the stem of plant number two, you have a long tendril from plant number one. And it's bound, and as plant number one drifts away, it's trying to pull on that, but it's not really working. So basically it's coiling like a, kind of like an old school telephone wire. So that attaches to what I'll call plant number one. So plant number two has some anomalies in my opinion. It has these uh, smaller undeveloped tendrils that just appeared. I don't recall seeing these before. And if we go further here, here's an example of a tendril from plant number one binding itself. And this is another tendril from plant one. It's binding a plastic support column, although not tightly. And here on plant number one, further upstream, you have another tendril binding to another tendril over here, which also belongs to plant number one. So there's a lot of this going on. Um, it's not really productive, and I don't really see what this secures. So things are undoubtedly going to get more and more complicated as time goes on. So this is plant number one. It's the most robust one. It has this kink because at one time that kink pointed upwards like this, but then, you know, it got too long. I didn't have any support. It didn't have active tendrils, so it fell over and formed this, you know, acute angle and, you know, it circles around here. It has that leaf, that leaf, you know, I removed some dead leaves before. And basically it goes here. And this is a petiole leading to a leaf, but otherwise it goes down in that direction. It goes down, and that's another dead leaf that I have to remove at some point, but uh, it's that thick one. And, you know, it has a leaf here off of, uh, geez, it's kind of hard to reach through. Well, there's a petiole there, as you can see, and it kind of branches along this axis and it comes up here and there's a long tendril. So there's a strong tendency for honeydew vines to grow upwards due to phototropism, growing towards the direction of the sunlight, but at the same time their weight keeps pulling them back down and they have tendrils to bind to 
themselves and other honeydew vines and any other host plants nearby that can serve as uh, climbing substrates but honeydew can't grow really really uh, high up because uh, the tendrils are weak and eventually if this thing fruits that's way too much weight because honeydew is just way too much so it's better that things remain close to the ground anyway so this stem over here is really thin but it's actually belonging to the number two plant you know there's uh, that wound there it actually healed up pretty well you know I don't understand the white powdery appearance but the rest of it looks pretty green it's not some kind of ugly brown so the stem is kind of odd looking here but you can see that extra little meristem fuzzy meristem that's sticking out next to a dead petiole so that's the wound I was just talking about and it goes underneath and it goes to our right and it curls up here uh, try to visually ignore all those uh, petioles branching off from the main stem and it kind of zigs and zags uh, honeydew as you may have observed kind of alternates in direction between petioles and main stem so finally we end up here and we go to this uh, part where it's bound by a tendril from plant one in a very interesting fashion I hope that doesn't restrict the girth of this stem and finally we get up to here where we have the shoot apical meristem and another tendril that may try to bind this plastic column and finally we have plant 3 which begins here and it has a regenerated shoot apical meristem that has produced two very green uh, very dark green little leaves uh, they're very small that's a pattern I've observed with honeydew it seems like the more you damage it the smaller the subsequent leaves will be just because it's playing catch up and here's a plant with a compromised leaf and if you look at the petiole on the left and this leaf over here it's just so dark green compared to all the other leaves in this pot so this plant has depended on this uh, medium sized leaf for nourishment all this entire time for weeks before it could regenerate a shoot apical meristem by making one of these uh, um, originally submissive meristems dominant in the absence of a shoot apical meristem to suppress it with auxin. But if you ask me what's truly miraculous here, it's that there are these two tiny little leaves here and they sort of resemble cotyledons in shape. They don't really resemble true leaves. So I'm just fascinated because I just saw that right now and I don't really know why that is. Uh, true leaves wouldn't really grow in that kind of pattern. So I don't really know what's going on here. I haven't heard of cotyledons being regenerated. Like, why would that be? See, if you look here, you can see this fuzzy spike in the middle. Um, it's kind of hard to do this. But anyway, that is the shoot apical meristem. So it's generating, you know, probably two more neutral leaves as we speak. So I don't understand the physiology of what I'm looking at here. You know, why are the petioles so short and underdeveloped? Why is everything clumped together like that? It's just bizarre to me.